Well, I thought we might begin by with a little uh, a mind exercise, which is I want to ask all of you to pretend that you're Sandra. You want to be a painter, but today painting is no longer at the center or mainstream of art. Uh, you want to be a landscape painter in Montana, and Montana is very hard to capture uh, in a painting for reasons we'll go into in a while. Third, you want to be a contemporary painter. You want to be part of your time. That is to say, you don't want to just copy what other people have done. You don't want to repeat the past. Uh, you don't want to become an illustrator, uh, in effect, copying earlier achievement. How can you be, then, a painter of the contemporary Montana landscape? Not an easy task. Sandra and I have spoken about it at length uh, very many times in the last years. And uh, she recently sent me, really as part of our ongo ongoing discussion, an essay that had been written by Guy Davenport that I hadn't read that I thought bore on that last bit I said about contemporary, how to, how to be a contemporary painter. And the, the title of this essay was, uh, was the symbol, or the archaic as symbol, or the symbol of the archaic, I guess. And it's really about, uh, about pre-art art, before there was any sense that what people were doing was making art, the really old stuff, 100,000 years old, 200,000 years old. And this was a way that, that Sandra, I could tell, was feeling that her work was meeting this contemporary test. So Sandra, why don't you tell me a little bit why this essay um, had this, uh, why it interested you? I won't say it had an impact, because you've been thinking this way already, but why did it interest you? I responded to it because it was about recovery of primal energies. And um, landscape to me is about primal energies, being in landscape, not necessarily landscape painting as we know it, but uh, my experience of landscape growing up as a girl in, in uh, the hills and valleys of Northern California. And um, also it, he, Davenport says that modernism was really founded on the recovery of these primal energies by uh, the early uh, the poets, modernist poets, and their interest in recovering these primal energies, these beginnings of civilization. And um, Picasso, Brock, Brancusi, Matisse, they all were looking at, uh, in Picasso's uh, instance, Iberian archaic sculpture, which was native to his land, um, BC, and uh, African uh, sculpture, uh, too. These were expressions of a time before uh, industrialization which they were in reaction to. Well, yes. Uh, uh, actually, art has often progressed or moved forward, if you can use that phrase, move forward, by looking back. It's often a recovery of past things that give people a new idea about how to move into the future. I think that Guy Davenport overstates uh, the importance of the archaic for modernists, but there's no doubt that it was enormously important, particularly for somebody like Brancusi, if you know cycladic sculpture, you can see that Brancusi comes very much out of that. Uh, I think that it stays contemporary, using these archaic notions, in part because our own civilization is uh, desperately losing a sense of touch with uh, not only the landscape, but with many things. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, it, it's, it's a contemporary problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've probably all had the experience, if you have children, of some time when, you, when you're visiting some place that's a little basic, and they see, for the first time, they see that the chicken has legs. Well, they, they must know that. They should know that. The fact that they don't know that has <coughs> meant that they, they're losing something. So Sandra's uh, work uh, is, I think, very much uh, in line with this uh, feeling of recovery, and that's such an important, uh, really, job or role that we have uh, living right now today. Yes, and uh, I did uh, choose to move to, to Montana because I was already exploring landscape, but I was 
uh, very much part of my heritage, local heritage, was the Bay Area figurative tradition of painting. And I was sort of working around that. But it wasn't getting at something. And I had, was discovering and realizing that my subject was landscape. And so I had an opportunity with my husband to move to Montana where there's lots. And the, um, the uh, ratio between people to land is reversed, which I liked. Um, provided hunting opportunities, which I was a, a beginner at at the time. It also, as I uh, lived here and, and was in conversation with conservationists, you begin to see uh, that there are remnants all around the state of prairie grasslands, of wild patches of ground that haven't met the plow. There, there aren't that many. As I hunted over the years and would find these marvelous coolies where a plow can't get, you really sense this is a very old place. And um, there's lots going on in those coolies and draws. And I just am quite thrilled and feel quite privileged to be in these places and have access to them. I find them kind of primal places. And so that's my um, evolving uh, sense for landscape. And it is... Landscape is really, a, it's sort of the wrong word for you altogether, because landscape sounds like the land has had a haircut or something, right? It's been scaped or sculpted. And indeed it has. I mean, very often, a lot of very great landscape painters, Constable, for example, create a sense of the harmony between uh, a, a farmer and the land, a, harm, a har harmonious relationship between people and the environment. But that's not really what Sandra is doing. She's interested in a harmonious relationship, but she's going back before that to, as she says, more primal material. And so I, the word landscape almost doesn't apply, does it? Uh, it's, it's, you're more, it's terrible, you're more just a land artist or a person who works with land or, or who responds to the land. Because you're not really shaping it, are you? I mean, you, do you have a feeling that you're sculpting it in some way? No, no. And in fact, I rebelled against the, the term landscape. And I even said this once to Patterson Sims. Well, he totally dismissed it because I just thought landscape um, didn't apply to, what, to how things were moving forward. I'm part, again, my heritage is studying the European-American European art tradition, painting tradition, the tradition of landscape like Constable is framed within a rectangle, does stop. You are removed. This, I see the painter really as kind of a spectator and, and is painting something that's at a distance. And while certainly I've had that experience myself, it's been my motivation to um, move in move in closer, very close, as close as I can get, as close as putting my hand inside a bird. So that is a very different experience than Well, think of, think, think of what our society does with the idea of the picture window, how we love to have a house with a picture window. And picture windows are very nice. I'm not knocking them. But you have a rectangle in your house, that in your house is stable, and it may become Monet and changing all the time out there in the rectangle, but it's the same rectangle, and you are on one side, and you are looking through the glass at something else. That's kind of what a landscape painting is. Um, what Sandra does is move into the landscape. In other words, you go through the window and into the stuff itself. That's, I think, why hunting is so important. It's a focused way to be in the landscape. Not yeah. again wandering around like a tourist and saying, oh, isn't that pretty? Isn't that a nice view? And let's mm -hmm. take a picture of this. That's very different from walking with purpose in uh, one of these environments. Mm -hmm. And your painting, I mean, it seems to me that your painting has that episodic quality of being in an environment. I mean, do you have, is there any sense of time in your paintings? Do you think of that, of them as occurring, uh, not just as an instantaneous snap, but as uh, something more layered and time? Yeah, I am still using the rectangle of the canvas, of the traditional rectangle of painting. I like it. 
I don't feel a need to do shape paintings. I don't feel a need to do installation. I like that illusionistic space. I think it's very much a part of our interior experience. The layered experience, because the marks I make are really, I see them as uh, stimulated by not only the moment when I hear a bird sound and I make a mark, which it defines a space and it might be behind me, but it also is stored muscle memory, it's stored uh, emotional memory, really, which goes back a lifetime. So um, in that sense, it's layered. And then, of course, I would like the way I paint to give a sense of that. Well, so the pictures are conveying an experience. They're not describing exactly uh, an experience in the land, but they're conveying an experience of being in the land. That seems to be your motive, uh, something that you're trying to summon uh, that sensation, which is a very complicated sensation. When you're walking in, uh, in one of these pretty primal landscapes, um, many things are going on at once. You're not just looking at one thing. You know, you're smelling this, you're hearing that. Uh, you're, you're the, uh, you know, something, some light is bothering your eye over here. You want to scratch. You, it's all kinds of things are going on at once. And your experience of that day, of that walk, of whatever you're doing in the landscape, is built of many, many different elements like that. And somehow, mysteriously, we don't really have words for this. Maybe that's why we have poetry. That <clears throat> comes together, and that is the experience. And Sandra, uh, when I said time, I, I meant that, that there is that feeling of, of uh, much is being brought together. You, you feel that the painting is a, an experience of, of being in the land, uh, but it's, you're trying to bring together the fullness of that experience and the variety of tones. Of, the word that came to me was condensation, as, as I've gone along in these paintings, of moving from a more general, uh, formal, uh, visual articulation and early work that was more formal, you know, a composition of the elements of painting, line, color, shape, etc. But through the last 20 years, and it's taken time for this to come together, these American Fork paintings have become more particular. The marks are more particular, or they're more specific to things I experience in landscape. And the line itself isn't any one thing, it's a combination of things. So I see, I use the term condensation, of experience. Well, talk about some of the very particular problems that the Montana uh, landscape offers. You told me in the other room uh, with the big pictures that some of them were rolling and that that has something to do with, uh, <clears throat> does that have to do with the, the 360? This is an obsession uh, of mine, which is that in the landscape here, uh, so much that's important and, and why the rectangle has so much trouble is that so much is going on in the periphery of your vision, you know. It, it, you're not just focusing, you're aware of sort of stuff here and there, there and there. That's the big sky, right? And how do you deal with, with that? Is that an issue for you, the, the, the sense of, um, of uh, focus, really? It's sort of wide. I was, the earlier American forks were structured along horizontal and vertical, sort of the inherited grid that we contemporary painters have, grew up with. I liked what happened in those paintings. It got, they got at something, and then I thought, take a big risk, get off those, that grid. Then I found, quite naturally, sort of the organizing principle was this rotation. And two of the paintings over there were be begun at U Cross in Wyoming, and I was very much aware of the waxing of the moon so there's that movement, but then that's also about this 360 horizon line, which I would say it's really my experience in the field has made me very aware of. The 360 horizon, not the two-dimensional traditional landscape painting. That is a very different awareness of landscape, and I find it very exciting. Then sort of within that radial composition, and radial compositions you find all over the landscape. You find it out there in plant structure, 
and marine life, etc. And I was surrounded by fossils at your cross. I'm surrounded by fossils up on the east front. That brings in another dimension of time and of scope in landscape, which I hope somehow finds its way into my work. Well, I think it's done does, and it's quite mysterious how you get that feeling of scale and 360 and, and what is actually a, a two-dimensional canvas. I think some of it has to do with the erasures and with uh, the sort of way you place the marks within the white. You begin to develop a feeling of, of scale or an implication of scale, even if the scale is not literally there in the painting. That is a sort of surrounding kind of uh, uh, feeling. It gives you an unusual sense of, of where you are in relation to the objects that are being, that are in the picture, the, the visual life of the picture. It's not only the 360 which sort of keeps you on a horizontal, uh, but it's also this way and down below. When you're out there, you can reach and touch and, you know, the birds fall out of the sky. They fall and you can reach down and pull up some grass. And so it's really a surrounding, a sort of being inside space. And also the node, these sort of concentrations that are in my painting, I see them as uh, concentrated energy. They can be a kind of a gravitational concentration. I think that's a different sense of space. If you're trying to convey the experience of being in the Montana sort of landscape, especially the High Plains experience, you have to somehow convey both very small things and really almost limitless things kind of at the same time, uh, because that's what it's like, isn't it? I mean, you're seeing the, the grass right there or a bird right there, but then you're also seeing, you know, way out there. These are occurring at the same time, and that's what the experience is. And I, I think your painting, Sandra, uh, uh, work with that kind of close focus and, and much more general and, and distant focus at the same time, or try to bring those two things together in a way that is true to the uh, actual experience? Well, yes, I hope so. I mean, it wasn't my intention. I it just, I think it's been an evolving process. I mean, I didn't know where I was going with it, but you just go with it. Yeah, now tell us about feathers. What's your thing about feathers? <laughs> yeah, my fetish with yes. feathers. Um, well, uh, that was just um, accidental. I uh, went to the museum, uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York, had been living in Montana, had been hunting in Montana for some years. Uh, I walked into the pre-Columbian room and saw the feather works of the Wari that are in the Michael Rockefeller collection. These are from Peru, from 600 AD. They're beautiful, beautiful plumage of tropical bird feathers composed in these wonderful designs. And so as I was looking at them, they felt familiar. Now, why would they feel familiar? And then I felt, well, these birds are from a particular landscape uh, in the Amazon and evolved in that landscape. And then I realized, well, I have bird feathers that I bring home, uh, and why not use those? But there's, there's, very, there's visual qualities to a feather that are fascinating, right? I mean, the yeah. geometry. The of geometry, the structure, the coloring, the, the color, you know, they are really quite a work of engineering. And they're a mark, you know, I just, I zeroed in on them as just an abstract mark. And that's how I use them in my work as I sort of have this conversation going with them as a mark. And, uh, and you quite literally use your thumb, I mean, in some of the smaller yeah. pictures. The, the, she's cut the feathers so that they, they could almost be a brush stroke or a finger painting thumb stroke. Uh, and they bring this extraordinarily tangible sense of the landscape into the, the painting. You, you pull them up and you pin them in such a way that they develop very, very different kinds of looks and forms. And it's almost a sort of surreal play with the feather. I mean, you see all these different, or I do. The feather, too, is, we think of them as very delicate, but they're really very strong. And that's another quality I would like to get in my work, especially the paintings of very 
delicate washes, sheer, evanescent, but then also these sort of condensed, tough little nodes where, you know, new life can spring out or who knows what springs out of those <laughs> nodes. I don't like the word nodes very much. I don't, I well, like in the, um, in a branch. In well, the, okay, I like that. Those nodes. Right, those nodes. I, I yes. sort of think of a doctor's appointment. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, okay. But uh, now, the, um, the, do you want people, when they're looking at your paintings, do you want them to immediately know that there are feathers in them? I know not, they're not always, but do you want them to see the feather immediately as a feather or to come to the feather? And well, to come to the feather, yeah. Now, what's the difference in that feeling? Why do you like it that way? Although there are some feathers that are by themselves, just yeah. on the white ground. Well, a surprise, because, you know, the birds surprise you, right, Brandon, <laughs> in the landscape. Uh, you know, you're walking along and they uh, terrify you when they explode out of the bushes. Um, no, they're just, uh, because that's, well, I haven't really thought about it. It's bird behavior, it's animal behavior, it's our behavior. When we want to remain hidden, we want to remain integrated. Uh, some of us do. But feathers are such a, talk about primal, they're one of the truly yes. primal uh, things that we have, and they're very ancient, too. Mm -hmm. So uh, even reptilian, right? Didn't birds evolve from? Dinosaurs. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah they're, they're a fantastic element. Now, they give a very different And they feeling. taste good. And they taste good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're really a savage, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I, I mean, am. Yeah. Uh, I love that when you said putting your hand inside a bird. Yes. Well, that's primal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell me about the about the pelts and the and the deer skin. That's a, such a different material from uh, from uh, the feather. Well, I wanted to paint uh, paint with oil, and I did a few uh, paintings that were uh, working with integrating oil paint and the feather worked. I like the collage element, so I moved to using deer skin hide, cured hide. And of course, that evokes the Native American tradition and their um, conversation with the landscape, with the land, with the place they lived. I like the, as I say, the aggressive quality of the leather dangler coming out. Dangler sounds like antler. Why don't we look at the picture and have her? Oh, yeah. Right here. You can't see it, of course, but there's a dangler, right? There's, mm -hmm. uh, there's some deer. Um, coming out some right there, and it's the painted part here uh, makes rhymes with the actual uh, deerskin danglers coming out. And I think throughout, this is just me, but if, you, if you're talking about the Lascaux Caves and ancient deer, I mean, this is a, it's very much like a bullhead or a deer head that you would see in, in primitive painting. And you'll, you'll see that there's, the, this is a painted element, and this is, and then this is painted too, but there's also these antlers coming out, and there's a reflection between um, uh, the reality, the actual deer stuff, and painted reality, illusion, and real. So for me, when I look at her paintings, I, I see there are all these different little experiences you can have that, that come together in a variety of ways. This is probably not at all what you intend, right? No, I don't like you to see deer antlers there, but... Uh... Well, I, no, I, I, I use antlers only because they're definitely, you're gonna, if you see deer skin, you're going to think of, you know, and they're coming out, there's two of them. You're going to think antlers, but you're going to think many other things at the same time. That's the point. I mean, they're not, it's not trapping you into a literal yeah. representation of a deer, but it's just, it's, it it's, is, I think, inevitably going to make you think about animal forms and plant forms and yeah. insect forms. Yes, uh, and planetary forms. Sandra, you said that some of these are actually depictions sort of of sound or evoke sound. Could you show us one? What, what, what's a sound look like? It would look more like this. These, these quick little sharp notes going through space. Mark did ask me about, do I use any kind of vertical or horizontal? And I always somewhere establish a vertical. I asked if, if she begins with at least an implicit grid. Earlier on, as a, sort of as a safety net, right? You would, use, yeah. you would use a grid, which is a modernist device, well known. 
close to Hmong painters. But the grid has, has become much more evanescent. Yeah, and actually... But it's still sort of... And this is something I've written about. This, going from here to here to here, up here, that is a deer trail. That is a game, <laughs> it's a game trail. Okay. Okay? <laughs> and, but that's something like, that, but that's the geometry of landscape that is made by wildlife, which I find very exciting because it's always wonderful when you're walking through the forest to um, come up, come on to a game trail. You suddenly feel yeah, you're you feel safe. Like, yeah. You're and in a safe zone. And it's easier. It's and it's easier. easier. Yeah. So that's how they get around. But I'm, that's my structuring device now, <laughs> rather trails? than the grid. Animal trails. That is an organization of space that when one walks it, there's something very comforting about it. And it does bring you back to that kind of archaic life or, or oh, space. So to me, mentally, I, I like it. What about or the black, that. almost horseshoe shape there? What are you doing there? Well, part of it is in reference, I say, to the moon. I was watching the moon. I used to, I didn't like circles for a long time. I thought they were boring. Well, you start looking around, there are a lot of uh, circles everywhere. So it's kind of just a primary shape. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you have a lot of them. Course. Yeah, and some contain a lot of paint, some are drawn just with charcoal. It's, uh, it's something fundamental. <laughs>